Hey folks, Kevin here. Well, it's January 25th, 2018, and uh, today I'm going to uh, do another Ask Me Anything uh, episode. And today's uh, response uh, to uh, video is in a response to a comment and question left by Dar, uh, Darlene Wallace, my sister-in-law, after she saw the video, asked me anything, are you vegan? Where I talked about whole food, plant-based uh, medicine and um, in practicing a, a, a regenerative lifestyle. So Darlene asked, Hi Kevin, very informative and interesting. Nothing boring here. Have you ever done a video on things to do to live a regenerative lifestyle yet? I have never heard of living that way before and it makes sense. So that was about three days ago and I was super pumped to create this video. And the next day, I spent all day creating the video and editing it and then after watching it the following morning, yesterday morning, I said, no, I can't post this, it's, it's terrible. Uh, so yesterday and today, I've worked on redoing the video and, and what I found was the, uh, the breadth of the subject is so enormous that I think all I would do is confuse viewers if I just rambled on as thoughts came into my head and I needed some structure to help me. So I put together a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation, which I'll go through in just a moment, but it's really just, oh, I'd say the, the, an introduction to part of the components, the, the various elements that need to be open to thought of, to be uh, entertained when one is, when is thinking about living a, a, a regenerative lifestyle or using lifestyle medicine approach to, to uh, achieving one's goals. So I should start off by saying, so what's the goal? Uh, my goal is not only to live as long as possible, but to, and that's the lifespan, I want a tremendous lifespan. I also want, much more importantly than how much I want the lifespan, I want a health span, and that means that I want to be as sharp, I want to be not dependent on other people, I want to be, I want to be independent, I want to be creative, I want to be a, a mentor, I want to be, an, a, a, like in some cultures, as, the, as, the, uh, as people get older, they're valued as an elder, not as someone who everyone feels that they have to take care of, but a, a, an absolutely important, integral member of the community and looked at as, as a person of value because they still are sharing more and more. So without any further ado, I'm going to start the slide presentation. So hold on. So lifestyle, your lifestyle is either helping you or hurting you. And so I choose to make my lifestyle my form of medicine, kind of like Hippocrates said, uh, first do no harm and let food be your medicine. And we're going beyond that. We're looking at lifestyle as a form of medicine. So striving each day to become the best version of ourself. That's important. Our genes don't determine our fate. So forget that, that myth. Our, our fate is not determined by what our parents gave us in our DNA. Every day is a new day, full of opportunities, and we can learn to adapt and overcome. We can repair damaged tissues and relationships. We can reverse chronic disease, and we can restore health. So the first thing I'd like to, to mention here is going to Dr. Dean Ornish website and the website is lift, listed up above the www.ornish.com and on his website is just a plethora of wonderful information there's a whole topic there in the in the top here and it's uh, 
called lifestyle medicine. And that's where you learn to love, love your life and the important components of, of lifestyle medicine. And when we look at that, that center group of four icons there, uh, it says an awful lot. It, it's talking about the apple is eating well. The person sit meditating there is about less stress in your life. The heart means loving more. And the exercise icon there is about moving more and more. And this goes across all age groups, all, all, all groups of people in whatever stage of health that they're at. If they're very extremely debilitated to the point where they're, where they're just interested in providing the best, most optimal health, health plan for their children. So I really encourage everyone to go to Dr. Dean Ornish's website uh, for, for a great deal more information. He is uh, one of the, the key persons that I have uh, followed with research and try to incorporate many of the, uh, many of the techniques and, uh, and lifestyle changes as a result of the work that he's done pioneering work that he's he's actually done. So what about lifestyle medicine? Uh, so lifestyle medicine is a regenerative, restorative, a reparative, and adaptive way of living. It's a way of, of caring for our bodies at whatever stage of health we're actually in. It isn't the regenerative medicine and so regenerative medicine is is a whole group of uh, I'd say cutting-edge technologies that are being uh, still going under extensive research and there's lots of funding for some of these modalities so looking at the use of human tissues cellular therapies gene therapies biological devices and combination products being used xenotransplantation that's where where transplants from non-human species are happening and stimulation of endogenous our own self-repair and all and you know um, one of the things i would say is regenerative medicine is really desperately needed during my uh, my fourth year of veterinary school uh, I wrote a, um, I pre I, well, prior to graduation, I presented a, a senior seminar, a presentation on a project that I've been working on for over a year, and it was a degloving injury in a German Shepherd dog. And a degloving injury is where the tissues are rip ripped off the, the surface of the body. This dog was run over by a vehicle in a motor vehicle accident and all of the soft tissues the skin the muscle and all was ripped from oh, above the wrist right down uh, th and some of the toenails were, re were removed as well this was open to severe infections extreme pain and it took it took well over a year to get this wound to heal completely and it was it was an arduous uh, journey for the patient and for myself to get this done and uh, at that time it was the best that that could be done now and and I think about all of those people who suffer burn injuries all of the veterans that have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan who have extensive burn injuries uh, and what what was necessary before was just uh, like taking sod from one part of the lawn and putting it on some bare ground skin grafting taking tissue similar to what I what I talked about with a dog that I worked with and that's uh, many surgical procedures very painful uh, prone to wounds systemic infections a whole variety of, of challenges throughout the, the wound healing process where nowadays with some of these techniques instead of removing sod they can actually plant seeds they can take cells, stem cells. They could take belly fat from liposuction that are our stem stem cells and seed those over the areas where the where there were extensive burns or degloving injuries. So there's so many amazing things that can be done. Another thing that I always found interesting with regenerative medicine is how is it that salamanders? Well, they can, if they'd had an amputation, they could regrow a limb. And scientists have been looking at that for a long time. And they've, they've noted that, geez, children under, I think, three months old, some of them that have had 
uh, avulsions, uh, ampu uh, uh, partial amputation or complete amputation of, of the distal, the most distal tip of the finger. And if there was some nail beds still present, those children might grow that, that digit back and look pretty much normal. So science, scientists are doing lots of research into this whole field of regenerative medicine. But that, that's not an area that, that I have uh, much, any experience with, and it's not what I'm presenting on now or in the near future. So I'm going to take another little sidetrack here and talk about uh, the eight forms of capital as described by Ethan and Gregory from uh, AppleseedPermaculture.com. Uh, as many of you know from some of my previous presentations and all, I'm uh, an avid permaculturist. Uh, and that's a design science, and I won't go into any more of that uh, at this point. And I've discussed this when we talked about investments. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when we're talking about investments, we got to talk about, geez, well, what are the forms of capital? All of us are familiar with financial capital down, in, down at the bottom. But let's review some of the other forms of capital uh, as described by Ethan and Greg. So intellectual capital is that, that knowledge base that we have. Our spiritual connection, uh, capital is that connection to something greater than ourselves. Social cap, uh, capital is the connection and networks that we have. It's the people uh, capital. Material capital are those non-living physical objects. It might be our tools, it might be a vehicle, it might be a home, it might be a barn, it might be a, a, an old wooden fence. These are all material forms of capital. Financial company, uh, sorry, financial capital, well that's money, currencies, cryptocurrencies, securities, IRAs. Living capitals, well that uh, capital, that's animals, plants, wa water, and soil. And I've done a quite a bit, uh, a few videos on the, the life in soil. And that's the, the, the soil microbiome. And we'll, we'll, we'll be talking more about microbiomes very shortly. What about cultural capital? Those are shared elements within a community. What about experiential capital? Well, those are our skills, our abilities, our, our hobbies, our, our uh, professionally trained skills as well. So all of these are really important to be aware of. And I always think about how can we tweak this? How can we know what to invest in and how much to invest in these areas? Because they're all, they all go together to make a, a whole person, a complete person, someone who's very interesting. So previously I've talked about the three different types of investments. And today we're going to be talking about regenerative investments. If we're talking about lifestyle medicine, we want to have, have our investments pay dividends. So again, just briefly, there's three types of investments. There's degenerative investments. Those are like when you buy a car, it, de it's, it's, it depreciates the moment you drive it off the lot. There's those generative investments. Well, you may buy a $2 pack of seeds. Uh, spend time and energy uh, planting the seeds, uh, watering the garden, then harvesting the garden, uh, uh, harvesting the produce from the garden and cooking it or making your salads or making your smoothies, whatever. That's a generative investment. You get out of it what you, what, what you put into it. And, and of course, there are uh, gray areas that, that, that go. So if the crop fails, it might be a de degenerative investment. If it's one that you cut, cut off the top and the base regrows, well, that's a gen regenerative investment. Now those regenerative investments, I like using something like a peach tree or an apple tree or a walnut tree. Well, after, after you plant it and you and do minimal care, the amount of input into that system, into that element, is minimal over time. You did your initial investment and then you just do less and take care of it along the time. But each year it gives you it gives you a, a yield, and it may do that for many years, and then ultimately you may harvest the wood from it. You may make some fine cabinets. You may use it as burning wood. The flowers on it will bring uh, honeybees, which which may you may go ahead and have uh, hives, 
and you may have honey and it'll, those bees will come and take care of your gardens as well. So there's so many benefits from regenerative investments. So that's what lifestyle medicine is. It's a regenerative investment. Now, I put this little icon up in the corner here showing time, resources, and whatever the, 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 uh, the element is that you're investing in. So an example might be, let's say you're building a home. Well, like us, we took a lot of time. We did spend pretty good money and resources on the building materials. We did shop around and get the best prices we could but we didn't go too cheap when we built the house. It took us a long time, but we created at that time, which was the ideal house. So you can have any of any two of these three items that I mentioned. Either you can have something done quickly, expensively, and, and have, have a great product at the end, or, you, and that means you're paying a professional to do it, or, you can do things slowly, do it yourself, and put good money into the product, in, into the investment. So just looking at those three things, you can either have it cheap, you can have it expensive, you can have any two of these, or you can have it high quality. So the quality is gonna be determined on how the other two components. Low quality, if, if you do it fast and inexpensively. High quality, if you do it expensively and uh, uh, fast as well, so you can have some professional do it. Or the ultimate quality is you take your time, you make the heaviest investment, and you get the, the ultimate home. And that's just one example, so I don't want to belabor that. So now we look at those eight forms of capital, and we have the original eight as we go from the top to the right. We have the intellectual capital that we discussed, the experiential capital, the social capital, the material capital, the living capital, the financial capital, the spiritual capital, the cultural capital, and then two additional ones that I, I add to the mix, the health, love, and empathy. All of these things all are necessary for excellent quality of life, for the optimal life, as I see it anyways. So these are all parts of a, of a big puzzle. We have to take each one of these components and put it together in a way that makes sense to us. And when we go through our investments into each of these areas, let's say you go off to school, you spend a lot of money on getting an education and you're in debt as a result of getting that, that education, but you learned an awful lot, you added to your intellectual capital, you, you have great uh, experiential capital, at least for some period of time, you're making lots of money but because of some new technology or downsizing or moving the factory some other location, you could lose your job. You will never lose your intellectual capital. Uh, someone can't take that away from you. You can lose it, but they can't take it away from you. They can't take away your experiential capital. They can't take away your social capital. You could lose your material capital in a fire. You could have, have, have injuries in life. So again, this is a puzzle, puzzle. It's for each of us to think about and have our investments in it because they all add up to investments in our, in our lifestyle, which is a form of medicine. And ultimately, you can get the gold at the end of, at end of your journey as you get old. All right, lifestyle medicine. Never be afraid to dream big. Uh, don't let anyone stomp on your dreams. So here we are. Here are what I think are, are key elements to excellent lifestyle medicine. Aside from those forms of capital that we talked about that really help us to invest more so. So the more educated you are, the, the, and this can be you know, an autodidactic, you can learn totally on your own. This day and age with a, with a cell phone and internet access, anything is possible. So nutrition, we're, that's an area that, that I'm fascinated with and I'll be doing lots of work with that, with that topic in the future. This is an area that I've got to do more work on personally, fasting. Uh, there's certainly great studies showing how important fasting, fasting is and calorie restriction. 
The microbiome is another area that I've been working in uh, for several years now, and, and it's so important. Exercise, I've got a mixed gambit here. I'm, I'm doing really great during the summertime, but during the wintertime, like right now, I'm working on some of these YouTube videos and spending time uh, putting together slides and, and material and doing the other things around here. So I'm not doing as well with the exercise. And I encourage each person to go through these, each one of these topics and see how well you're doing in them. Are you getting good sleep, quality sleep? Are you getting enough of the sleep? What about stress? Yes, stress can be good, but stress can be overwhelming. Is it harming you? What about your spiritual capital? Are you meeting your needs there? Do you feel, do you feel that you're fulfilling those needs? Your intellectual health, your emotional, your self-awareness, your relationships, your intimacy. What about the people you're around? I'll spend a little bit of uh, time today because it, initially this might seem like a weird one, but this is something I decided to include in lifestyle medicine. It's about being part of the right tribe, the right team. Hygiene and body care, that'll be future topics as well as, well as environmental factors. These are things that I've mentioned before that, can, that, that are damaging to our bodies and all, and that's a, a really big topic of interest to me as well. So, dream big. Don't let someone tear you down or make you think less of yourself. Be, design your goals and be prepared. If you're really going for it, you're gonna fall down. You're gonna run into obstacles. Learn to adapt and overcome. And if you do those things, anything is possible. Believe me, anything is truly possible if you really keep working at it. Uh, don't take no for an answer. Never give up. Surround yourself with the right people. Do all of these things, and I believe this is, is a path to success. So nutrition. Uh, diet is the foundation. Food is medicine. Hippocrates, Hippocrates said, you know, let food be thy medicine. He also said, first, do no harm. And in future episodes or videos, I'll, I'll go over some of those top topics. And when it comes to nutrition, I want to look at science and evidence-based resources. And I've talked about that before, and I won't go into more of it at this point, but those are the resources I want to utilize. And I use a whole food plant-based diet. And when I say diet, I'm not talking about a temporal event. I'm talking about lifestyle that's always being modified based on the latest research available. Uh, the whole food plant-based diet is the only diet proven, absolutely proven, to reverse the leading cause of death in the United States, cardiovascular disease. It can open up coronary arteries. You know, stents and bypasses, they're, they're transient temporal things. They really don't prolong life. They can increase quality of life temporarily if you're in, if you're suffering angina, significant pain. However, a diet can do that same thing and actually unplug those, those arteries. So whole food plant-based doesn't mean, oh, you have to be vegan. This is an inclusive approach. Yes, if you're, if you just uh, were told uh, you have severe occlusion of multiple coronary arteries and you need bypass or you need to change your lifestyle that means really giving up a lot that's excluding uh, processed meats refined sugars you know uh, uh, you know dairy products and so on but for most people before you get to that to that phase in life where you're where you're severely ill uh, you may just be in the, in the early stages of diabetes and you just may want to change a couple of elements in your life. Uh, again, lifestyle medicine approach and using the whole food plant-based approach is not saying you have to be vegan. And I put uh, Dr. Ornish's website to a PDF here on the reversal of coronary artery disease, and I'll put a link to that, I hope I remember to, in the uh, description of the video below. So I mentioned earlier that, that tribes, and, uh, and this has to do with culture. Um, tribes are groups. Groups of 20 to 50 p people actually form tribes, and they create the culture of the environment that you're, you're going into. So when we go into a workplace, or we go into a classroom, 
before you go into a community setting. These are all culture groups that are, you know, 20 to 50 members and, uh, and they have created a culture. And we're going to talk about those cultures. Teams are, are smaller groups. So the, the, Jim Rohn, a motivational speaker, I think he's the one who's at least uh, known for saying, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. It's so important to realize those people that are around you, that, that you're closest to, that you're spending the most time with, how much of an impact they have on you. So what I've got to say is choose those people widely, you know, wisely. Uh, we all need support and choose those people. When I was uh, in veterinary school, long before I was scheduled to go into the clinics, I would spend my off hours in the clinics and I would find those people that I thought would be the best examples, the best role models. And so I told, I never told them this initially, later on they learned this, but I adopted them as my role models, my mentors. And so choose your mentors wisely. You can't choose your family, but you can choose the people that you spend the time with. So choosing the right tribe. So uh, Dave Logan and John King wrote a book several years ago, probably over a decade, decade ago now, called Tribal Leadership. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I know I'm spending a little bit of time going over this topic, but I think that the, what, they, what they shared with me through that book was the importance of recognizing the culture and the groups that you're, you're you're, you're involved with. So we really have five different groups and we get from the lowest functioning, group one, to the highest functioning, group five. The, and both ends, both one and five, are the minority of the population. And as we get closer to three, we get to the majority of the population. So there's more people involved in the third group and, and fourth group, uh, second, third, and fourth groups than there are in the first and fifth groups. So the first group are the people who feel life really sucks. Uh, they undermine uh, group efforts. They're indifferent to the cause. Uh, the second group is my life sucks. Well, you be in a group and you, you feel like I'm just not interested. All right, I'll go along, but you're not, not gonna get 100% from me. I don't think anybody else is working as hard. I think I'm a victim of the situation. The next one is the group that has someone who says, I'm great. We have a current example of someone nowadays. And they're the lone warrior. They're the one, the only one who can accomplish the mission. They're the one who's the dominant one. They're the one who, who dictates uh, what needs to be done. They tell others, you know, what to do. And if you don't do it, you're told, well, you're fired. So. The next group is, now this is getting to be a pretty high functioning group because everyone in the group feels a part of the group. They're all working together. It's a well-oiled machine, a well-working uh, well team effort. They're team players. These are the people who, who recognize that they're great. The only fallback I would say is that they're, they're aiming to beat another t team, their competition. Uh, so these are the folks that, that will go to the World Series and win, and go to the um, Super Bowl and win, or the World Cup, or the marathon, whatever, well not the marathon, I'm sorry, the decathlon potentially, uh, not the decathlon, I'm thinking, what's, well I can't think of it, think of some group sporting activity, you can see an area that I'm weak in, sports. So that's the we're great, and this is a really high functioning group and you're blessed if you're working in this group. Uh, you're doing better than most. Now, the ultimate group, life is great. Not we're great, life is great, everyone's great. These are the people who have passion and values and, and a sense of genius amongst them all because they're all working together for a common cause. They're world changers. They're, they're the, the ones that, that do amazing feats and they all feel part of it. They don't feel like, oh, my job isn't that important. They're all working together. They all see the value. And in this group, leaders lead by example. Leaders eat last. 
they aren't setting themselves self up as the as the one who knows it all and going to tell everybody else what to do. So that's a big difference. We're gra gradually transitioning from group three to group five as far as cultural groups. So choose the right tribe. Here's a copy of, uh, here's an image of tribal leadership, uh, their book, and I do recommend that. I'll put a link down below in the description of the video so that, uh, so that you can go to that. Um, and next, intellectual wellness. Well, this is another important one. So, and it, and these are all stage appropriate, <coughs> excuse me. So active, active participation. So scholastic uh, pursuits, educational programs. You may be, be a student or you may be an instructor or you may be an, an instructor's assistant. Uh, cultural activities, uh, community activities. All of these things are really important. And then various exercises, uh, so reading, research, striving to gain a greater understanding. Uh, something that, that I think is really important to do is actually learning to debate, but debate that, that, that position that's opposite of your own. Do it with a friend, don't do it, don't do it with a stranger going and debate something that, that you believe is the wrong thing. Uh, it, it allows you to put on someone else's shoes, it, it, you know, actually get, get closer to empathy, understanding another's perspective. Uh, the greater the understanding we have is really wonderful. Sometimes that's what our elders can share with us, the perspective of someone else when we only see our own egocentric uh, perspective. So observe. Uh, one of the first, first principles in permaculture is observe and interact. So I say observe, ask why, invest, investigate, bring back, reignite that childlike curiosity. You know, and don't stifle the small children when they're around you. I wish I knew these things when, when my kids were young so that I would encourage them to ask more and more questions and then we'd research things together. So games, music, crafts, hobbies, uh, you know, all various skills that are really good things to enhance and, de and further develop your intellectual wellness. When, we, when we're thinking about intellectual wellness, I would say that your, your intellect is like a well, a well, well, let's say more like a bathtub that's got a little leak. If you're not exercising it and constantly renewing it and applying that information you learned in one area and see, does it apply to this new area that I'm investigating now? Does this information apply? Is it useful? So exercising your, your intellect is important. Now on to our emotional health. Well, happy people are more likely to work towards goals. There's more of a group consciousness. They're more likely to face their fears of failure. They're more likely to get up after they've fallen down, to try again and to keep trying and to keep trying. Often we look at, at you know, people who've accomplished things and, and you know, I, I don't remember the quote from Edison with the light bulb, you know, uh, I don't know how many thousands of times before he got the light bulb to actually work, but he found, I don't know, thousands of times that it didn't work. And if we all gave up after the first couple of failures, well, then we wouldn't have the light bulb. We wouldn't have all of the modern things that we have nowadays. Those ball players who, who, um, I can't think of these famous ball players right now because that's my how naive I am with sports, but the person who shoots uh, shoots uh, three pointers consistently, well, I'm sure that they didn't hit all their their first 5,000 baskets every single one of them. They had to fail quite a few times, and so the more that you work at things over and over again, it, it builds on your happiness. You feel a sense of accomplishment, but that sense of accomplishment helps to, to create our, our emotional health as well. So it feeds back into the system. Seek and find, uh, oh, these happy people are more likely to seek and find needed resources. So I can remember times in, in my profession, there'd be those people who were around me that were uh, pretty much upbeat and knew what we needed to do, and they would seek out and anticipate what was needed 
and make make those resources or get those things done so that we could proceed and, and have a good outcome with patients. So, you know, emotionally healthy people attract other people with optimism. So, there's my cute little minion. So, be happy. I wish I could do the be happy dance now thing for you. So, chronic emotional stress. There's times we feel overworked, underpaid, not appreciated. There's a fears of downsizing. Oh my goodness, I don't think I've prepared for this test. I'm a failure. I'm not going to make this test. Oh Lord, the boss thinks the job I did really stunk. Uh, Bob, he really doesn't like me very much. So we feel the emotional stresses. I'm not good enough. And so these emotional stresses have, have, have the ramification. It can worsen blockages that we have in our arter arteries and cause arrhythmias. And even kids as young as 12 years old and standard American diets already have the beginning stages of uh, atherosclerosis. We're having materials uh, that deposited in our arteries and uh, as we get older and older and we get into our 30s and our 40s and our 50s and we get develop hypertension because all the stresses and strains, well, that's going to affect our circulatory system. And we'll get more into those topics in future videos. So who, people who are depressed, lonely, and isolated are 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those that have a sense of love a support network and feel connected with others. So support groups are so important. They bring people together and they create community. Exercise. We talked a little bit about this with Dean Ornish's site. Uh, and exercise is, is one of those areas that I mentioned that I need to, to work further, further in. So I would say it needs to be stage of life appropriate appropriate not necessarily age appropriate because there's people who are in their 70s and 80s that are more uh, fit than people in their 30s and 40s so it's stage uh, appropriate so you may be recovering from a surgical problem you may have a chronic debilitating disease process so we just want to make sure that the exercise is regular moderate exercise uh, I used to run when I was very young and I did lots of uh, heavy weight uh, lifting, not in a, in a gym, but as the show off, if you will. And, uh, and I did some injuries to myself as well. And some really aggressive uh, sports can create some injuries that you can pay later on in your life as a result of having those sport injuries and repetitive uh, activities. So if you're sitting for prolonged periods of time without getting up regularly, that's that's an issue. Nowadays we see that there's the standing working desks. There's treadmills with desks uh, put above them. So it's and, and it's moving very slowly but staying active. So 20 to 30 minutes of walking every day I think is a minimum. Yoga, meditation, Tai Chi as well as other non- um, I'm going to say non-impacting uh, exercise and, uh, and uh, sporting activities. And then our endurance uh, exercise, our aerobic uh, activity is, is important as well. So we want to focus on our flexibility, our strength, and our balance. And all of these are critically important as we get older. And certainly remember our aerobic exercise activities as well relationships and intimacies we're we're real animal lovers in our household so we we really get lots of affection from our animal friends i enjoy being out in nature and uh, and i have a relationship an intimate relationship with nature so uh, i hope you understand that when i describe that so relationships uh, build bridges and repair and maintain bridges as necessary. They, a good relationship, there's triads in it. And this is something I also learned from the author of um, Tribal Leadership. Uh, it's, it's these triads, you know, that are so important. 
is a three-person relationship where the third person is a stabilizer of the relationship of the other two. So here we have this cute little cartoon up here. So let's imagine that the gold person, the red person, and the blue person are all close friends. And I think it's important to have all three there, if at all possible. Some of us can't have that, but if you can have it, having three very close uh, people in a relationship. So how does this work? Well, let's say the, the blue person and the red person and the uh, gold person are all out to dinner and they're having a great time and the red person tells a joke and for some reason the blue person feels offended or feels slighted and doesn't really want to talk about it. They feel hurt and they feel withdrawn whatever the conversation was about. Or, you know, it could be gift giving time that they didn't get, uh, feel that the gift that they received was appropriate or whatever it may be. We're all hurt at different times by what we hope that the other person is gonna say or do for us. And with that third person, that third rail, what can happen is, well, they don't take sides. They don't go, go to the blue person and say, oh yeah, red's a real, a real dingbat, uh, blue, Yep, that was insensitive what, what, what uh, the red person said. Blue, you're right, I'm gonna be your buddy forever. Rather, what that gold person will do is go and talk to the blue person and find out what is going wrong. What, what, and the blue person will share with them because they have a close relationship, a trusting relationship and say, well, you know, I expected this or I was hurt by, I felt that that was an insensitive comment. And then the gold person will, will help to bridge that relationship by going to the red person and saying, geez, I just wanted you to know that blue was hurt when this was said. They felt, they felt less than, not good enough. And that allows the red person to approach the blue person and say, I'm sorry, how can we make this right? And I know this was a real long <laughs> winded example, but I think really understanding the power of having uh, relationships and the dynamics of these relationships is potentially very rewarding and very helpful as we progress through life. Having a good marriage or partnership or friendship, relationships are so important. Uh, good, good marriages will have other people that are not uh, not trying to undermine the relationship, but they're there to support the relationship. So even at a partnership at work, you know, the two partners are there, other people need to be there to help support the relationship. It's about the culture of, of the people involved, trying to get up towards at least number four or number five. So this is one of the, the things, a topic that I think is so important uh the regrets of dying people probably many of you have seen it post uh posted uh um, information on what people have regretted uh, when they're dying what they've said in their hospice bed so down in the lower right hand corner this is an image of people who are probably in their in their uh 70s and maybe into their 80s and they're all smiling they're all in close and this is the sort of relationship that we want to have where you where you're feeling fulfilled now they could be just posing for this picture but i i hope to be optimistic and think that they're they're actually feeling a sense of joy and and a part of uh, a greater uh, group uh, having fun so what are some of these regrets of dying people we'll start off with number five i wish i had let myself be happier and that may be due to training and, and them feeling you're not worthy, you're not good enough. Uh, those things that you've, that tapes that you've played back over and over again in your mind uh, as a result of something that, that, that you recall and feeling not worthy, not good enough. And you weren't worthy of, of self-satisfaction, happiness. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. The sense of loss that those comrades, that support group, that third person uh, or that fourth person that helped you to feel better about yourself in, in various circumstances. The value of friends. I wish I had had the courage to express my feelings, my true feelings, 
at times I should have stood up and said what I what I believe or what I think I should have said this I should have done this number two I wish I hadn't worked so hard unfortunately uh, in America we think that uh, we have to work so hard to to have a sense of achievement of accomplishment we need to buy these things the bigger house the fancier car the prettier wife uh, whatever it is the, the kids who work real hard so we get our kids into the very best colleges whatever it may be sometimes working hard isn't the best thing and that's a second regret of people in hospice I wish I hadn't I, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself and not the life others expected of me. And that is so important. So those are, are things that I want to address throughout my life and realize that these are things that I just don't want to do. I don't want to live, live a life based on someone else's expectations. I want to live a, a happy, healthy, and fulfilling life. And I want to be around long enough and still have my fac faculties, still have my abilities, and be a positive role model and a mentor to others that, that seek advice. So when we're in our, in our final days and we have those companions, those people around us and, and, and loving us, live life fully without regrets know that we're all going to get there someday so lifestyle medicine there's a lot more to come on this on this subject please like and subscribe yeah that's right like that click that like button and subscribe please share this with your friends as well if this these are things that you're interested in if you're new to this topic, look at some of my other videos and leave comments. Let me know what sort of things you're interested in. If there's more interest in this uh, video, uh, this topic, I'll, I'll continue as time permits and add more and more to this. Uh, this is an active area of pursuit for me. This is a passion. So ask questions and leave comments. This is the end. Thanks, folks. I hope you have a wonderful day and enjoy life. Think about the things that, that were in this video today. Talk with your friends and loved ones. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.